Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs, the ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build, so please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by a longtime friend and copywriting expert, Otto Rupsiman. When he was 19 years old, Otto was inspired by a living copywriting legend. Uh, Seeing how copywriting produced billions of dollars in sales for a single person, Otto committed himself to becoming an expert at the art and science of salesmanship in print. Twelve years later, Otto has has written successful campaigns selling everything from high-end coaching, information products, seminars, skincare, supplements, vertical jump training, and even definitive guides for breastfeeding mothers. Copywriting is important because of how it allows a business to standardize and scale their sales process. Instead of having 10 plus sales reps out in the field all doing things with their own flavor, you can do it all with the written word and make sure your prospects get the exact same experience. So I've asked Otto to join us today to share with us answers to questions such as, why is copy so important in everything we do? What to hone in on with your ideal prospects to create high converting copy? How to apply principles of copywriting to every critical touch point in your business? And how to double your revenue by tweaking a few key elements, these critical success factors that can make your revenue soar and much, much more. So, Otto, thank you for joining us, my friend. It's been way too long since we last talked. How you doing? Doing good, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you for being here, man. I know you're in Miami and you could be down at the beach enjoying your morning. Beside this hangout here inside on, you know, online with us um, to help myself and my listeners out. So I appreciate that. Now... I'm sure that really piqued a lot of people's curiosity, and that's usually what I like to get into first is kind of the background. Like, do you come from a family of entrepreneurs? How did you get into copywriting and business and marketing and sales? I mean, were you taught this stuff by your parents growing up? You know, like, is it is it hereditary or, were you, you know, what what happened? What's your story? No, uh, my, my story is this. I, I was raised by a single mother in, in the rural woods of Maine, um, literally out, out in the middle of nowhere. And... Um, you know, uh, she just she always taught us, hey, you know, if you want to learn something in life, just just go learn it. And um, so I, uh, you know, concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just go figure it out. You know, so um, when I was uh, when I was nineteen, I went to this uh, this business seminar, and I, I was I was really I was always really ambitious, and I went to this business seminar, and and um, I, I met this copywriting legend there, and and uh, he he spent a whole day with us just going over copywriting and and uh, talking about a lot of the failures he'd had, and and then you know finally got into some of the successes he had. And this is a guy who had literally sold billions of dollars worth of, of you know products and services through the power of his uh, you know of his written word, and you know that that really inspired me. Uh, from there, I I just I dove in head first into studying uh, marketing and and you know really becoming um, immersed in, in the, the, you know getting the marketing bug and reading everything I could and you know uh, yeah, just doing all the, the the things to to you know to learn it and, and just you know fully get it and you know start uh, start producing good copy. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So. I mentioned kind of briefly at the beginning, and I kind of summarized it. But can we talk a bit about um, um, can we talk about it a bit more right now? Because copy is something that is for a lot of people might seem benign, like oh, it's just words on paper. Like you know, get an intern to write you some copy, or you know, something like that. Get a girl with nice writing, and you know, something. I've heard all sorts of things like that. But why why is copy so 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 important? Well, you know, copy is in every single thing you do as a business. Uh, it, it's literally, it, it's salesmanship in mass. You know, um, if you take, you know, uh, uh, an incredible sales person, uh, whether salesman, saleswoman, you know, someone who's just incredibly good at making orders come in, uh, and you, you bottle up their, uh, their presentation, you, you bottle up um, the way that they communicate into uh, into you know something that uh, a mass of people can see or read or you know um, uh, listen to, then it, it 
it enables you to scale and you know it's in the scaling that enables you to uh, to really drive your revenue uh, to a higher level because it's not just one on one it's it's one to to you know uh, infinity of you know number of people that that you get to to watch it or listen to it or read it and so uh, but it doesn't stop there copy is is literally in my opinion in every single touch point that a customer or a prospect or a client has with your business every conversation they have every email they read every uh, package they receive in the mail from you you know every single one of these is a touch point and at each and every single uh, touch point it, it's it's a communication that either does one of a, of a couple things it either, either you know makes them more inclined to continue doing business with you or to do business with you for the first time you know it, it's either a big positive for them or it's a, a negative or, or a, a moot point, you know, like where they, uh, and if it's, it, it, say, say they call in and they get a customer service representative to a company and, you know, they have a bad experience with that. Well, they're, they're not going to, you know, chances are they're not going to do business with that company because, you know, that, that customer service representative didn't, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's a touch point and the copy of, you know, how that person communicates on the phone uh, that, that has a huge impact on the business. Yeah, and I fully agree on that. And I wanted to say something too because there's something you mentioned that I think I've heard a lot of copywriters gloss over this and I know I've brought it up but I actually haven't heard anyone else bring it up and that's when you talk about how like the power to scale. I think there's also a lot of business owners who don't think in terms of creating a marketing campaign that you could roll out nationwide. They're like doing, hey, we got a four day 50% off sale. Hey, we've got a, like, you know, like these small flash kind of sales or smaller promotions. Hey, we're doing a Valentine's day thing, which of course, maybe you could do that nationwide, but it's really hard to know and measure and get an ROI on the copy or on the promotion itself. But whereas where you're talking about, like, this is about creating something to of where you're meeting someone in a specific instance, whether it's a letter that goes to first-time buyers or it's a letter that goes to leads once they become a lead, once they fill out your contact form or whatever. And that's something that is a standardized piece of material that goes to this group of people. Either it's your first introduction to them or it's the first they hear from you after they buy or right, or any of these things. And it's something that would allow you to really scale out because there's pieces of copy that have been mailed for over 15 years, correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> so I think that that's something I just wanted to bring up because – I see that a lot too. Like a business owner, they'll do something. They'll do like a two for one special. And they're like, wow, that was great. Made some money. I made an extra couple thousand dollars. Now what do I do? And I hate that thinking. I think partially because I'm lazy, but also because I think it just it limits your, your where you're at. And so I just wanted to bring that up because we're talking about scale and this grandness. But um, <clears throat> I think also just you could take a really skilled copywriter and put them on a dead end street by having them write a promotion that's only going to be mailed for two weeks and to a group of like 100 people and then – you know, reach its end. Now, I guess there's still value in that for sure. I mean, generating sales, especially if you're upselling an existing group of customers. But I like what you mentioned, I think this is the real true power of copywriting. It's, it's about unifying the voice through your entire business, I think as well. To, it's almost like they talk about your brand. You want to have that same voice in everything you do and say. You want to have a really clear and concise uh, personality, I guess, and you want to make sure that you're expressing your values. And like I said before, if you can have this one letter and mail it to a hundred thousand people to a million people, you're going to get a way better standard, uh, or be able to predict the ROI way better. If you have the same thing, which we call a control in copywriting. Sorry, I know it's, you so know some of this auto, but I'm kind of saying it for the listeners, the people listening in, anyone that's listening in on this, that doesn't necessarily understand the power of copywriting. You know, if you had a team of 10 or 100 sales reps go out and try to serve and talk to these 100,000 or these million people, each sales rep's got their own personality, they're having good days, bad days, right? They're sick, they're healthy, they're, they're on spot, oh, they forgot this part of their training or not. But with copy, it's just crystallized, not necessarily written in stone, but written in ink and printed on paper. And then that's something that you could mail out consistently to hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And when you've got something that works... Um, you can really, really drive it home. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like, um, for instance, direct mail guys, a, a lot of direct mail guys won't mail a list unless the, the list universe is, 
you know, uh, over a certain um, number of names. You know, if, if you go and do a, a 5,000 uh, name rental and you mail to it and, and you, let's say you, you pull a double over where, you know, for every dollar you spend, you bring $2 back in. Uh, great. That's, that's a wonderful, that's, that's a, you know, that's a front end uh, uh, as far as, a, a, you know, a list that you're just mailing to. Awesome. You just, you just made a profitable campaign. But uh, it, it's, it, if that list only has 30,000 names on it, then you're, you're not really going very far. But if it's, if it's got, you know, um, uh, 3 million names on it, then, you know, you just made yourself uh, a fortune because, you know, you, you, you can mail profitably to, you know, a, a heck of a lot more people. Yeah, and this is a great uh, segue. I want to bring up something from the late, great uh, Gary Halbert. His son, Bond Halbert, has been on our show. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Gary. And in fact, something that helped me with one of my clients do one of our first uh, million dollar campaigns was applying this to a different medium. It was the internet, but I'm going to read for it for everyone here because I think it's really important to understand how this works. So this is um, one of uh, Gary's Boron letters, uh, letters that he wrote while he was in in uh, white collar jail for, for fraud. So his house had been Broken into, apparently his house had been broken into and the thieves had stolen some uh, garbage bags si or garbage bags full of envelopes. And those envelopes had orders for his product in because he was one of these copywriters that would mail out letters and get orders back. And back then they didn't even have credit cards. So people would send uh, money or checks in the, in the mail. And since these bags were stolen, they didn't know who to contact to let know that, right, the order, like what had happened. So instead you have a, a bunch of complaints of people saying they paid for something and didn't get it. So Gary ended up going to jail doing for a few months, uh, doing some time for that. And while he was there, he was writing letters to his son about how to pass on this, this lucrative business he was in. And in one of the letters he goes, it seems to me that I feel like outlining the steps to direct mail success. So that's what I'm going to do. Step one, find a hot market. And then brackets, it says mailing list. Step two, find or create a product, in brackets it says preferably paper and ink, end of bracket, to sell to that market. Step three, create a direct mail promotion that describes a product or service and the benefits of owning the same. Step four, make a test mailing, 1,000 to 5,000 pieces. So that means mail out 1,000 to 5,000 of these letters. Step five, analyze your results. Step six, if results are good, Mail 20,000 to 100,000 more letters. Step seven, if results are still good, start rolling out and taking care of business. And I applied this, and in fact, it's funny, Otto, because right before this interview, I was in Facebook ads going through and seeing what ads have we gotten a couple hundred clicks from and which ads haven't had that much yet and which ones are marginal results and which ones are good results and turning this on and turning that off. Because I think the same thing applies whether it's online, it's offline, it's talking about direct response marketing where I'm able to measure and track, I did this, got this result, and that's what I wanted, or it's subpar, or it's marginal, and maybe I can improve it, and either green light, keeping it running, yellow light, figuring out we got to find some way to make it a little bit better, or red light, just killing the project in, in, in total. Um, you know, and here they're talking about 1,000 to 5,000 mail pieces, but online it could be clicks, it could be impressions. Um, if you were at a trade show, it could be foot traffic past your booth. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about that because I'm hoping, I'm hoping there's a bunch of people getting some aha here and really, really, really excited. But Otto, I, uh, with the copywriting skill, what are some of the most important parts of copywriting? Like, yeah, what are the critical, I mean, in any skill set that you have, there's fundamentals that really make the difference. So what are some of the fundamentals of copywriting that really make uh, make or break your campaigns? Well, you know, there's a number of things there. Um, uh, I just want to comment. Uh, I, I remember uh, reading the Boron letters uh, uh, in um, winter break when I was in college, and um, I, I was... Uh, I was, you know, stuck on campus at University of Maine, and and um, was, there was like, you know, maybe four people, five people on campus. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. It was, it was maybe a little bit more than that, but uh, uh, I remember going through all of Gary Halbert's uh, letters and reading the Boron letters back, uh, uh, back over that winter break. And uh, man, that guy, that guy sure gets gets. Uh, he he surely got me motivated for for. Uh, to write copy, to to do marketing campaigns. I mean, he he definitely knew how to, you know, light a fire on people's butts and get them going. 
<laughs> That's very, very true. Yeah. So what's the most, what's the one most important, one of the most important things when writing copy? Uh, testing. I mean, um, well, all right. So your headline is always going to be the, you know, uh, your headline, uh, if it's an email, you know, who it's coming from, cause you got to build a relationship with, with people. But, uh, really your headline, uh, is, everyone comes back to that. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, like you were talking about Facebook marketing, and we've talked about um, direct mail. The thing about direct mail is, you know, you get a piece, and you know, maybe you're doing an A B split test, maybe you're doing a, an A B C split test, where you're you're testing one uh, mailing piece against another, uh, and again uh, against another. To you know, um, on five thousand names, you typically need uh, you typically need about. 1500 names a direct mail to, to to be statistically significant so you could tech you know you can pretty well get about a uh, an abc split test in on, on a direct mail campaign and and you know have some statistical significance to to work from um the uh the cool thing about facebook is you know i've got a friend of mine who he'll go and test 50 ads uh to make sure, you know, to figure out which ones work the best, and that's, you know, you learn a lot about the um, the conversation with your marketplace when you do something like that. What what they're really clicking on, what they're really buying. You know, if you if you track all the way through to end sale, and it, you know, you, what you can do on on the internet, it, it makes it really uh, really clear to understand what your market wants to buy, and that's that's really key. Is you know, if you understand what your market wants to buy versus what you want to sell them, um, oftentimes they, they're, they're not the same thing. And that's something that I think even I struggle with because they say nothing feels like success. So after a few big wins, you start thinking you know everything and you don't need to go, you don't really need to do your due diligence, right? That's for people that are just new and getting started. So how do you recommend people do that? How do you recommend people try to figure out what their market wants to buy? I mean, we can test with ads, but you still got to find some sort of starting point so what do you do in copywriting? Like how do you get inside the head of an avatar? How do you build an avatar? Do you have a process for that? Um, I mean nowadays uh, you, know, you, you can learn a lot by going into the, the same market um, that this is in uh, on Amazon and, and looking at uh, comments and questions that people have uh, in, that, in that marketplace or, or finding an online forum and looking at the questions that people ask because that, that'll, that'll tell you roughly – what seventy percent of that market, uh, which is generally the, the the newer people to the market, want uh, from from you know uh, what's what's out there, what 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 problems they're having, you know the um, the biggest thing I've found is is focusing on the problems, the fears, the frustrations. Um, I, I tend to be a very optimistic person, and uh, in the past I used to use a, a lot more. Um, uh, moving toward copy, meaning uh, focusing on all the other positives, but if, without a pain, uh, it, it doesn't give people, you know, mot really a strong motivation to move away from, and and it, it's the pain that gets people to buy. Somebody said that. What was it? Um, I remember uh, maybe it was Perry, maybe it was Belcher. He was saying someone was saying that you know, think of the church. Uh, I'm not like I'm not a church goer or anything, or a highly religious man. I'm spiritual, but I love what he said. He said, you know. Um, fire and brimstone get people to church. Once you get there, it's all about heaven. But it's the fire and brimstone that gets you there. So um, I think that's an important distinction too. Now, you don't necessarily want to scare people though because, um, I mean, you want to focus on the pain, but I think you have to be careful because you can, you can go too far. I've heard that pictures of beautiful smiles sells more dentist, uh, more dentist services than pictures of ugly teeth. But that being said, you still need to know what, exactly what you said, the problems, the fears, the frustrations. You have to, and you have to be able to, to tactfully tap into those, right? Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, to, to pull a quote from uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Wyatt Wood Small, uh, he said, if you can effectively uh, sell someone on the problem they have, then you're more than 50% of the way there to, uh, to, to getting them into, um, you know, if, if you can fully get them immersed in the problem, then you're you're well more than uh, halfway there to to get them to to buy from you. Wow, I love that. So there's two, Otto, you've dropped two big gems here. First of all, if people's listening to this, if their brains aren't tingling, you need to go back and re-listen to this. So first of all, we've given you a formula for marketing success. Uh, second of all, we're you know Cor uh, Corey, you're not Corey. 
Sorry, man. Otto uh, just gave two really great tips. So one is, I love that, you sell someone on the problem. So that basically means if you can articulate and really like, like if, you've, if someone's ever read a storybook and the, and the author paints the picture so well, you can see the once upon a time and the valley and the butterflies and the little bunnies eating grass and just this very vivid picture. If you can do that with the specific problem you're trying to sell a solution for, you're over 50% of the way to the sale. Yep. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And uh, um, to, to be to be very precise in, in what uh, I picked up from this gentleman, Wyatt, he said, um, if you can describe their problem better than they can, then they automatically attribute you as having the solution to it. Got it. Say that one more time. I'm, I'm a writer downer. And again, if, people listen if to you me. can describe a prospect's problem better than they can, they automatically – think you have the solution to it. Now, the other thing that you said um, that I thought was huge, I thought this is a huge tip because I think it's true. I think it. Um, there might be ex um, exceptions, but you said that 80% of the market will be new. Yeah, generally generally about 70% to 80% of a marketplace uh, are, are the newbies, the, the, the new to the market. Um, you know, like uh, let's look at um, people who are interested in learning how to make money online. Uh, the the quote unquote internet marketing industry. Um, generally, about seventy percent of that specific marketplace are people that are new to the industry that are um, wanting to transition out of a job into um, you know working for themselves that that want to figure out how to you know be able to work from home and 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 make good income and. You know, um, then you get about thirty percent of those the people in that marketplace that have have been doing some things that have been around for a little bit, and then you get a you know a smaller percentage of the thirty who are you know the people that are actively running their businesses and and you know building companies, and that's that's typically what you see um, uh, like for that marketplace, for instance. You know, and I love that because if anyone here has ever been a member of any sort of club or if they've ever trained in any sort of sport or done any competition. Um, for me, martial arts comes to mind because I had the martial arts school. And I remember every year, because the UFC came out and it made MMA really popular, and I used to uh, teach Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, which is kind of what the UFC is founded on. Not really, but um, sort of. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into that. But essentially, every year, at least locally, where my school was located, the tournaments, the the white belt. So it went the bio, the belt system went from going from low to high: white, blue, purple, brown, black. And black is like twelve years experience. So white is a brand new person. And I remember every year the white belt category would get bigger and bigger and bigger. But there'd still only be like three guys fighting in the black belt fights, you know. And that's those are the ones that kind of if you're a coach or someone, you kind of want to see the most more experienced guys. So all the really fun matches usually were purple, brown, and black belts. Um, but I remember one year we went, there was like four or 500 white belts. There was like 100 blue belts. There was like 40 purples and 10 browns and three black belts. And like that was it. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know why that is, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, that in most markets, it's the vast majority of people in that market. Depending, I guess, on what you're selling. Um, I mean, if you're doing carpet cleaning. Although I guess, yeah, even then, people that are new aren't are new to having someone clean their carpets, they'll be the ones looking. The people that are, are experienced in it, I think they're a bit more of a savvy buyer. They'll either have people already to turn to. They'll know, you know, they'll find like what they're comfortable Absolutely. with. Absolutely. I mean, and that, that's across all, all things. Um, you know, I, I, what, what I'm thinking of right now is I, I, I used to, I had a very great honor of, of being able to be trained by, um, uh, I had some training with a, um, a very, very exceptional samurai um, in the, the, the samurai system, the uh, Kenjutsu, uh, the art of uh, the samurai, they, they have um, uh, a seven sash uh, system where, you know, it, uh, you know seven um, different uh, belts, so to speak. Uh, um, and, you know, it takes years and years and years to get to uh, the fifth rank uh, and, and many, many more years to, to even get to the sixth rank. And, you know, uh, the sixth rank samurais are considered uh, grandmaster uh, samurai. And then, you know, there's there's one rank above that, which is uh, the blue sash. And it's a seventh rank samurai. Uh, you know, there are 
there are about, uh, I believe there's about 14 or 15 uh, actively training seventh ranked samurai in the in the world. And uh, when I was when I was training uh, under this specific individual, he was a, a sixth rank. And while I was training under him, he uh, um, his master uh, actually passed on and. He, he ended up be, becoming a seventh rank samurai, which is you know there's so few of them in the world that are that are actively practicing that it um, it's just it, you know the, the it's it's um you know a bell shaped curve and it's it's the very far end of one spectrum you know yeah and then you've got kind of the the large middle so I thought those were really interesting because if anyone here is a coach or a consultant or again even if you're doing services for people even if you're a massage therapist. I probably a lot of the biggest part of the market are people that are kind of on the fence and just kind of getting started into it, not new, not the person that's been getting massages year in, year out, and they're a veteran and they're like the easiest client because they'll come in and tell you exactly what they need and want, you know, and where it hurts and they'll be prepared and they'll shower before they come. It's going to be the new people, the people that have never really had a massage or maybe don't, you know, come from a long day of work and come smelly, you know, to get their massage or who knows what. But that that would be the biggest part of the market because they're the ones with the problems searching for the answers. Anyways, okay, that's that's interesting. I'm going to ponder on that after this. So what um, do you feel like you had to overcome certain challenges or milestones in your development as a copywriter and in mastering marketing and sales? Was there like a progression where you're like, oh, first I had to understand this and then I, you know, I kind of figured that out. And then do, do you see looking back any sort of process that you went through? Yeah, I I went uh, I went wide before I went deep, and and I'll explain that. Um, so I I started reading everything I could get my hands on in marketing, um, all the classic books, um, you know, the, the everything I could get from Claude C. Hopkins, Jay Abraham, uh, John Carlton. Um, incidentally, I, I uh, later on as I was coming up through the ranks, I was able to um, had the great fortune of being able to do some writing for John Carlton, uh, which was, um, awesome. You know, uh, uh, the guy's amazing. Um, then, um, along the way, uh, uh, just, just really, uh, digging into everything uh, I could. Uh, so I, I, I got uh, a good understanding of the strategy of marketing and then to, to really hone in on copy itself. That took uh, it. Really took me about seven years to to really become able to write uh, effective copy because I didn't get it. And and like growing up, um, I'd had you know um, uh, door to door sales experience, or or um, you know uh, when I was twenty, I I actually used to sell subscriptions of the New York Post on the side of the street in New York City, which great sales experience. I mean, you know, there's. Um, New Yorkers are, are uh, they've, they've got a big heart and and uh, they're also very busy people and to, to get them to stop on the street and buy home delivery subscriptions not, you know, not the easiest at times but you know you, you learn a lot from that so so um, not the easiest at times at all yeah yes basically some of the things that really helped me dig into uh, getting good at copy were, were to you know, read a lot of advertisements, uh, and then take very successful ads and and physically hand rewrite them the whole ad. Um, and that that's um, something that not a lot of people will actually take the time to do. But um, yeah, I've I've done that with uh, probably twenty twenty five ads, and it uh, it helps. It helps a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah, if you write in someone else's writing, you can kind of get into your muscle memory, their style, and you can kind of get into the nuances of what they do. So, um, but it's a lot. It's not just write at once. You got to write these things over and over and over and over. So the repetition, I think, really counts. So okay. So now seven years. It's a lot to really understand, like getting into the copy. Um, like it's a long time to develop the skill. So it's it's. I guess, yeah. Sorry, I just was thinking about that. Seven years to get into the copy. So I guess, how do you approach it? Is there a process you go through when you go to write copy for someone? Say I hired you as a, as a, um, I became a client. Was there, is there a process that I need to go through with you to help prepare you and get you ready to write copy? Yeah, in, in general, uh, it's it's really helpful to understand the the client and their voice. And you know, sometimes I've been able to do that. Sometimes. Um, you know, uh, I've had situations where, you know, um, 
people asked me to write some copy for a client and then uh, never wasn't even ever able to speak to the client. So, you know, sometimes uh, you, you got to you got to figure out um, what the company wants based on, um, you know, uh, uh, an email or, or, or things like that, where you don't get a, a real sense of the, the company voice. And that, that makes it a little harder. But the, the biggest thing is, is really understanding the, the, uh, the avatar. Um, you know, there's a huge difference in writing to, um, you know, uh, little old ladies in their early 60s who uh, are concerned about health versus writing to, you know, um, 25 year old guys who want to learn how to date women. There's a huge difference in the language you use, uh, in the tone that you use, uh, in the softness or, or aggressiveness, uh, in, in the types of stories you tell, which stories, uh, you know, that, that's probably one of the best things you can ever use with your, with your copy is, is, you know, having an effective story or two goes a, a heck of a long way to getting, uh, getting results with your copy. And holding people's attention too, because since, since forever, we've been telling each other stories around the campfire, right? Once upon a time and people go into a trance. So that's the, that's the old school marketing equation, A-I-D-A, -A, attention, interest, desire, action. First part is attention. You can't, tell your story you can't talk about your product can't anything if you don't have someone's attention and attention is often tied to relevancy relevancy to a pain point they have a frustration had relevance to their life relevant to what they're thinking about you know if i'm trying to sell pies but your child is is has just stopped breathing you don't you like i'm not going to get any of your attention in fact you're just going to be frustrated with me for distracting you so relevancy, I think, is a huge part of that, which kind of, again, comes back to where you talk about why the headline was super important back at the beginning of the call, because the headline is the first thing people read. I know newspapers, um, they actually have different people on staff to write the headlines to the articles. So even if you're a writer for a newspaper, you might write the article in the newspaper, but you won't submit the headline for that article, because when someone grabs a newspaper, you know, or even if you're scanning a blog, you scan all the headlines, and based on the headline, you decide whether to read the rest of the blog post or not. So it comes back to that whole attention thing. So knowing the prospect, again, comes seems to be like mission critical, number one, right? Yeah. You know, uh, a great place to to filch great headlines are um, are actually the National Enquirer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they write some great headlines. Um, another thing that you can do, um, uh, this is a uh, great tip for, for those of you listening. Uh, if you just Google search, um, uh, if you type into Google – 100 greatest headlines ever written, uh, then you'll get a list of, uh, um, of a hundred headlines that are considered the, you know, some of the best, you know, the hundred best headlines ever written. And, uh, as you read through those, they're all very formulaic, you know, um, like I'm going to do this right now. 100. Yeah, I actually pulled it up. The secret of making people like you a little mistake that cost a farmer $3,000 a year. Advice to wives whose husbands don't save money. Buy a wife. The child who won the hearts of all. Are you ever tongue-tied at a party? How a new discovery made a plain girl beautiful. How to win friends and influence people. Let's take that one, for instance. So if, if you take how to win friends and influence people and you, you look at the formula of it, it's how to blank and blank. So um, how to... Uh, and it's the two biggest things that that market want. They want to make friends and they want to be heard by others. They don't just want to be someone's kind of sidekick. How do they make friends and how do you become a leader? How do you stand out and be someone who's a mire? How do you influence other people? Those are the two biggest yeah. pain points. Let's look at the weight loss market. Um, how to lose weight and uh, feel more energy. Right, because you don't want to just starve yourself and then feel weak and lethargic because – Right, you're hurting your body. That's good. How a small, mis uh, little mistake that costs a farmer three thousand dollars a year. That would get me if I was a farmer and my farm was struggling, and I was trying to get up and above. And this is an old headline back when three thousand dollars was a lot of money. Um, you know, probably the equivalent to thirty thousand this year, this day and age, maybe even more. You know, that would definitely get my attention. What's this little mistake? Is it's, it's a little mistake? Could I be doing it? At least we'll get your attention and get you to read the next line. Right? Yeah, and looking at the formula behind it, you know, if you say, um, yeah, a small, a small mistake 
that lowered a mother's baby's IQ. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, it really comes back to looking at the formula or the structure behind these these headlines, and you know that there's there's a hundred that you can swipe and and uh, and test. You know, uh, in whichever market you're in. Now, with good copy, can you sell ice to Eskimos? Is that the whole thing? With good copy, are you able to sell things to people that they may not want or need? Well, you know, there's a really good book on marketing called Ice to Eskimos, um, written by John Spolstra. Uh, he uh, he took on a, a very um, challenging uh, uh, sale back in the, the 90s, and that was to sell uh, Nets tickets. Uh, the, the, the New Jersey Nets basketball team were – were constantly in the cellar. Um, horrible team. Nobody wanted to go to their games. So um, what he did is uh, he actually started. Um, uh, he, he put together a package of um, the. Uh, he started marketing the superstars of opposing teams, and put together a, a great pack. This is such a great story. So. Um, it was like Shaq and Kevin Garnett and uh, uh, you know uh, Jordan and you know a bunch of other uh, superstars. I think I think he chose five teams for it, and he went and he he um, he lined up uh, not only his promotions to talk about the uh, the superstars of the other teams for those games, but he also got um, Lou Holtz and uh, uh, a couple other prominent speakers to do a uh, before-the-game speech. And what he did is he went, and he went to all the uh, business people in the New Jersey area and sold them tickets to come uh, listen to Lou Holtz speak, who was uh, uh, the number one speaker in the nation at the time, and, uh, and these other, other top amazing speakers, and watch these uh, um, and, and promote it with uh, the superstars of these other teams. And sure enough, those five, those you know, uh, games with those five teams, they sold out, and um, you know, it, that was a pretty big feat in itself for them. That's awesome. So, what have been, what are the mistakes you see a lot of your clients making? Like when someone comes to work with you and you step into their business, and you're all right, we're going to help you get this copy written to whatever to build your build your audience to increase sales to get people to come back and buy a second or third time what are some of the biggest mistakes you see in a lot of businesses or with a lot of clients when you start getting work like starting to work with them they're too busy to think ooh ouch auto i meant your clients not me don't say that ow that hurt that was painful <laughs> that was so painful that was so painful. I just went through an experience like that where that's that was the problem. I was too busy to stop and look. Ugh. Ouch. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? Just don't make me cry on the on the recording, all right? <laughs> 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 and for the record, I'm not auto yeah. client, so he's not really talking about me, but I can empathize for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of business owners, uh, you have a bazillion things that you're, you're trying to do and – you lose focus. Uh, you, you know, you're you're trying to fix the. Uh, there's an old uh, story of Gary Halbert and, and John Carlton, where where um, you know uh, John Carlton shows up for the first day of really getting down to work and, and you know writing copy and, and getting you know getting everything uh, going. And right as he walks in the office to to meet with uh, uh, with Gary, uh, the the phone starts ringing and uh, there's a huge problem uh, with 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 uh, someone on the phone the um the, the copy machine breaks um the the landlord came down to uh, to have a, a little chat with uh, with Gary about something uh and some other huge thing happened so there's like four different fires going on right when he uh, he walks in and Gary says all right well uh hang on a second guys and he he walks into his office he 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 beckons John to to come with him he shuts the door he locks it and he says all right let's get to work yeah and and the the point of that story is uh, yeah, because John's sitting there and he's like, but wait, you got an angry, your landlord's here, he's mad, there's an upset client on the phone, the copywriter's not busted, your secretary needs help with that, I can wait, you can take care of that stuff first. And Gary's like, this is the only work yeah. that really matters, yeah. he's bringing sales through the door. It, it comes back to, to bringing in the bacon, you know, uh, as a copywriter, uh, you know, when I work with clients, it, it comes back to, um, really, it, it comes back to 
you know, getting revenue in the door and then making sure their, their systems are in place so that they can handle the, uh, the increased business. And, you know, if, if you don't have your, you know, most of the problems of running around with you, you know, um, too busy and in overwhelm mode is because you don't have systems set up. And a system is just a step-by-step -step process in a lot of ways. I mean, you can have an automated system where machinery does this and then this and then that. A workflow process, a flow chart, a mind map, uh, again, a checklist, you know, again, step by step. Those are all just, it's just all an example for a system. And I think that what you said earlier, and this is, this is part of one of the things where I said it was painful for me. So in my business, we've been creating a lot of systems the last year, year and a half or so. Because usually I've been doing tons of work for clients, but it's time to get things under my own house. So we really made an effort for that. And, you know, and that's just all it is. It's just a, a system for how to get something done to produce the exact same result every time. Um, so all the steps and all the considerations you need to take into, into account. And then every system needs a training system for it. Because just because you have the system documented doesn't mean that there's a process to make sure someone who needs to get that result do goes through the system the right way. And that's all a business is. A business is really just a collection of people working together to achieve a common goal, often in the servitude of others. That's really it. You're trying to serve a group of people. The team you've got are trying to serve a group of people and you're working together. And that's really it. And so all the system is is just instructions for how people should either work together, where the handoff points are, you know, and, and, and or um, how to get something done in case in your absence. Too many businesses are stuck depending on exceptional people, oftentimes the owner, because there's no documentation of how to get things done. And what a lot of business owners don't realize is that's actually a lot of the value in their business. I know people that have got uh, $2 million businesses, just, just about $2 million businesses that are trapped in them because they can't get the stuff or they haven't gotten the stuff out of their heads and they are the whole show. And I mean, trust me, a lot of, there's probably a lot of people that are like, whatever, I wouldn't mind that if I was making $2 million a year. Yeah, but if you never get the chance to enjoy it, you're trapped and it's not fun. And you think, you know, and there's lots of people that think they can just spend the money to get out of it. But like you say, they, it really, what ends up having to happen is they have to slow down so they can think and do things in a proper process. But it's always a juggling act. It's an art, not a science, because um, you slow down too much, sales might slow, yada, yada, yada. So it's a bit of a balancing act in that respect, wouldn't you say, Otto? Yeah, I would. And, you know, uh, I, I can think back to, uh, I'm thinking of one of my clients that I had in the past where, you know, they... Um, he was running about a 50 hour work week. Uh, once he put some systems in place, he was able to drop his, his working week, quote unquote, to, uh, to 15 hours. And, you know, with that extra, what, 35 hours a week, uh, you know, um, he was able to focus on driving in more revenue. And, uh, as a result, I mean, you know, um, his business tripled in size in very short order. Yeah. Cause that's the biggest thing. We beat the drum of build, the importance of building a team. And whoever's listening to this, if this is your first interview with us, I really encourage you to not only listen to this interview again, but go and listen to some of our others. All of our experts are phenomenal. And we beat the drum of needing to build a team all the time on this show because getting rich is a team sport. Remember, it's not just about you trying to make all sorts of money. And that's where I think a lot of people get hung up, including myself, is when you go to build a team, sometimes what in the in the short term what the owner or the ringleader of it all might be bringing home might be smaller because now they're paying more people you know and now you're sharing it around but the idea is it's like you're a coach for a soccer team or a football team or a baseball team you know and you might need to you know eat a little less because you brought this 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 home run hitter onto the team but the idea is now you don't have to stress out about where the home run's going to come from moving forward. You've got this guy and that's his job. And if he doesn't do it, you know, then obviously you'll replace him. And then the goal, ideal, ideally, everyone plays their role on the team. And as an end result, moving forward past the short term instance where you have a smaller lunch, everybody does better because everyone has better. And there's a great thing. I actually put it in my iPhone. I'm, I'm a big fan of using reminders to remind myself of things. Um, um, and I just added one that just says, why not the best? And that's just a great quote. So anytime you go to hire someone, why not hire the best? Anytime you're, you're doing a, you're getting something done, graphics for your site, why not get the best? Anytime you want to do something, why not focus on the best first versus 
what's the most cost effective, you know? And I think that that's a really important thing. I think that we're here to try and do the best that we can and put our best foot forward and provide the best solutions to solve the best problems. And what I mean by the best problems is, is the real problems, you know, don't, I mean, if you want to, you can help people with small problems, but if there's a recession, you know, that's not going to be mission critical. If you're helping, if you're serving luxurious meals that are like a thousand dollars a meal and the economy goes south, you know, that luxury is going to get cut off real fast. If you're providing families meals so that way they, the parents don't have to slow down because they're trying to work two jobs, yada, 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 and you've got some way that can feed a family of four and it's cost effective for everyone, that's a, that's a good problem. That's a real problem. And that's something that probably hang around for a while. So, um, Otto, do you have any habits that you feel have helped you on your path to success? Uh, yeah, there's there's a few. Um, getting around good good uh, marketers that helps a lot because it's the conversations you get to have. You know, um, uh, it, it really comes back to conversations and the you know someone who knows a lot about marketing and copy they can say one thing to you and you're like oh wow and you have this epiphany and you go out and you make a bunch of money with it. Yes, one idea. One idea has made me so much money so many different times. Just one idea, well implemented. Well done is better than well said. And so if you get one idea from this entire call, you know, implement it in 24 hours if you can because that will make a world of difference for you and your business. Yeah, so well said. What else you got, Otto? Really really ask your marketplace, you know, um, you know, spend spend time Asking them, and I'll give you a good example from a business that I ran for a while. Um, uh, well, this actually ties both of these points together. Um, so, uh, a, a good good friend of mine, um, uh, marketing genius, uh, his name's Jason Moffat. Uh, I was hanging out with him one time at his house uh, back when he was living in San Diego, and and um, he gave me an idea for uh, for you know to, to go do and. I thought it was a good idea, so I went and I, I, I built a business uh, teaching people how to um, increase their vertical jump. And then one day I went and um, at the point I'm making here with the, you know kind of sending a query out, I, I, I surveyed the marketplace and um, I found out that uh, so much more about them than I, I ever realized. You know, I, I, a lot of these um, people were, were younger than I was, uh, I was thinking they would be. A lot of them were, um, had different goals than I thought they would have. Um, and I, you know, I also got to find out who, um, who their favorite basketball players were. And, you know, by, by doing a, a simple survey to them, you know, was able to, to learn a lot about, uh, the things that I just, I had no clue of. And then I was able to just copy to speak to just those things. Yeah, we've had a guest on here twice. If anyone's interested in using surveys to get some of this data, go and listen to either of the interviews we've done with Ryan Levesque. He has a book called Ask, um, and it's all about that. It's using surveys. And, and what Ryan does is phenomenal. However, surveys are nothing new to marketing. There's a bunch of books. In fact, I even have one here. This is a good book for anyone that's interested. It's called The Psychology of Advertising and Theory and Practice, A Simple Exposition of the Principles of Psychology in the Relation to Successful Advertising. It's by Walter Dill Scott. The copyright on this is 1906. Um, yeah, oh yeah, it's part of the Forgotten Classic series. And in here, one of the things he calls it the questionnaire method. And it's it's basically that. It's ask people for, yeah, the questionnaire method in advertising, page 375. It, um, it's really simple. Ask people what they want and then give it to them. And now there is a bit of a, it's not always that straightforward and simple because people, <clears throat> that's where you need to get enough answers. And according to Ryan, you know, you, people can get by with about 120, 150 answers, but really you want to get a good solid 500 answers to your survey because a lot of the people that answer, they've got a pain or a problem, but it's not a, it's not a bleeding neck as we would call it, right? You want to help people with a bleeding neck problem because if your neck is bleeding, how much of a sales pitch do you need for me on, on why you need my band-aids? Almost none right? Your neck is bleeding. Just give me something to stuff in this thing so I don't die. Meanwhile, if I have a paper cut, now I'm like, I don't know, I'm going to look at these different types of band-aids. Do I want a cloth one or a plastic one? Or do I just want a paint on band-aid? Or maybe I should just put some gauze. Like now, right now I'm considering options and it's just a bit more work to get my sale. 
So that's where you really want to try and get those answers. And, and then like Otto said, you can really try to get to know who your target market is, the problems they've got, adjust what you've got, and then follow up with the copy afterwards. That's, um, this has been such a great call. My head's spinning. Sorry, that's why there's been some of the pauses. Because I got the gears turned in my own head. I think when I top off this, I got to get a bunch of work done. Because um, I'm just so inspired. Otto, what are what do you think is some of the, you predict is the future trend of this industry of copywriting of being a copywriter? You know, you mentioned already, and this is actually a really great tip that people they can put ads up online, they can test 50 different ads very very quickly and and come to one that gets a better response. How do you think that's going to affect copywriting moving forward in the well, future? Um... I really, uh, I've been noticing more and more that things are, are moving towards brevity and making um, making more of a, like, you know, headlines have always been important, but they're, in my opinion, they're becoming even more so. Hooks are, are even more important. How you How you open up and get people's attention because, you know, people's attention span are are shortening you know the we're, we're you know they're constantly having the battle for for attention and it, it's becoming harder and harder because there's so many more messages being thrown at people on a daily basis you know um uh <laughs> so on uh i'll give you a recent example for me on memorial day weekend i um I took that Sunday and I shut off all of my electromagnetic devices. I turned off my laptop. I completely turned off my cell phone. I didn't turn on the TV. And, and I spent the whole day with zero electromagnetics uh, anywhere around me. And I noticed that I, I kept kind of like wanting to go grab my phone and check this or check that. And... You know, but I, I had uh, made a commitment to do it a day just away from it all, and uh, it was very hard. But um, I noticed that my my attention uh, for the whole next week was was much more focused and much more um, lasered into you know to the things that were needed to be done, and, and I had one of the most productive weeks uh, of of the entire year. That is excellent. I love that. I love that. I'm actually going to do that as a challenge next weekend. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, can I go one whole day on the weekend without touching a single piece of electronics? Yeah. No, no TV, no cell phone, no laptop, no uh, um, uh, iPad or, or no car. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I just spent the day kind of, um, I went for a nice walk. I, I got a workout in. Uh, I did a lot of reading that day. Um, I really like that. And I think that's really important. Because here's the thing about fundamentals. And I mean, right now we're talking about taking a day, unplugging yourself. And I think there's a ton of benefit from that. Um, I know myself having been forced to relocate. I was living in the States and due to visa stuff, I had to unexpectedly relocate in a very short period of time back to Canada. I had a whole life and I had a whole future and all that stuff. It really didn't matter at the end of the day. But fundamentals are so important. We're going back to the martial arts analogy. There are certain fundamentals in everything that you do, and those fundamentals, when mastered, you can you can successfully use at the beginner level, the intermediate level, and the expert level to win, all right, or to, to be successful in what you're trying to do. But there are all sorts of fancy techniques, again, going to martial arts, that will only work on beginners, that will only work on intermediates, you know, because they won't work at people at the top, top, top level. And I think that fundamentals are fundamental for a reason. And anytime you can get back to the fundamentals of something, it's mission critical. I mean, if I had to choose whether I could learn some advanced double backflip, triple twist, gainer, you know, you know, from when I'm diving off a diving board into a pool, or I could just learn how to do a really nice, clean dive and just execute it perfectly every single time, I'd rather do that because the double twisted, triple gainer, like, it just might not be practical in a lot of instances. So I think this call, we've covered some really good fundamentals, and I just want to kind of recap. We talked about basically finding a market first, going back to that outline I gave everyone here about the whole the steps of creating the promotion, you start with the market first. That's the, the avatar, the survey data, the research on Amazon, book reviews or product reviews online and forum conversations, whatever kind of espionage you can, you can muster to understand what people are thinking about, keyword research, start with that first, figure out 
what product or service you could deliver um, that will solve the problem but won't break the bank for you up front. Then to create a promotion around that and to launch that promotion, how the headline is really important, all the things that we talked about here, brevity, how, you know, depending on what your data says, you also might have to realize that 70% might be new, that also that you want to be able to describe the problem better than they can because then they'll believe that you know the problem better than they do and can solve the problem faster, easier, quicker, uh, which is, I think I said the same thing twice, than they can, right? Um, and that if you can sell someone on the problem that you're already 50% way past, percent past the sale, what else are some of the fundamentals of good copywriting, Otto? What does good copy always include? Headline, uh, strong story, a, a super powerful offer. The, the more, the more, uh, the better and, and more irresistible you can make your offer, uh, the more you're going to sell. Um, having an, uh, a great risk reversal, I mean, a, a very strong guarantee, and then, and then having a good PS. You know, those are those are like the real key critical elements of of a good piece. You know, if you if you have a good headline, a great story, uh, an incredible offer, a solid guarantee, and and a PS that 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 really uh, wraps them back into the copy, then you'll do well. Well said. Good. There's also something here um, for anyone that's listening. Take a look at any copy that you're writing. And Gary Bensavenga had his five P's, problem, promise, proof, proposition, and packaging. So you want to make sure you're, you're addressing a problem, a unique problem. It's 10 points if you address a problem. Uh, no, wait, it's a, it's a, is it a urgent problem? That was it. 10 points for a problem, 15 if it's urgent, 10 points if it's, you're making a, a promise, a clear promise, 15 if you're making a unique problem, a uh, promise, proof, if you've got proof, 10 points. If it's undeniable proof, plus 15 points. Uh, problem, promise, proof. Proposition, are you making an offer? Is it, is it user-friendly, 10 points, then 15 points. That's right. Uh, proof, proposition, and then the packaging. And I forget what the packaging ones was, but it was, oh, it's like, is the value, is is the package itself? I don't know. I forget what that one is. Um, I actually, I just pulled up my Pennsylvania notes. <laughs> <laughs> From from uh, his uh, his hundred uh, hundred seminar yeah. seminar and um, it, it, the the packaging came back to the, the display how how it was laid out the um, mm. yeah uh, is it easy to cons it's like the delivery is it easy to get through and the other one is it is it valuable in and of itself yeah the, the, as he called it the cracker jack uh, uh, secret uh. You know, the, <laughs> the, the uh, little something inside a Cracker Jack box that uh, that's inherently valuable to them that they, they, they really want that gets them to, to buy the thing itself. Right, 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 right. So there's a little formula for people here. They're looking to grade their own stuff. Or, of course, uh, Otto, if anyone here is interested in getting in touch with you, if they value your expertise, if they're jiving with what we said, if they think, like, yeah, this is great, I, I need some expertise, and I'm going to... I'm just going to put a caveat. Yeah, Otto's my friend, but I'm going to say this myself. I'm actually paying, and it's unfortunately not Otto, but I'm paying way more than I'm comfortable with for three different roles on my team right now, and there's a reason. And this is a reason because there's a lesson that I've learned, and it's taken me a long time to learn, and I've had to learn it a few times, and I've just had enough with it. And it's that if you think hiring an expert is expensive, wait until you hire an amateur. And I've wasted so much money hiring amateurs on stuff that I've kind of made a commitment. That's where that why not the best? Why not? I, why don't I get the best person to help me with this? I could do it, but am I going to do it the best? No, then why don't I get it the best done? And I can tell you what Otto does fantastic copy work. So Otto, if anyone here wants to get in touch with you, either to consult with or ask questions to or maybe even hire to do a job, what's some of the best contact info? Easiest way to reach me is email. Um, my, my email address is Otto, O-T-T-O. Five six at gmail dot com. Um, I uh, I check it every day and and uh, that's that's the easiest way to get a hold of me and you know um, send me a, a bit of info on uh, what the project is or, or what you're looking to do and you know a, a way to reach you back and um, happy to happy to have a conversation and see how I can help you. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you, Otto. I mean, because you, you couldn't, didn't have to be on here to do this, but thankfully, just to help me, you're willing to come on and help some of my listeners understand. Because terrible copy, I mean, if there's any surefire way, one of the easiest ways to be successful in business that I've seen is to combine a solid business model with a skilled copywriter. Because 
you might have the best product in the world, but the business graveyard is littered with world-class products and services that nobody knew about, you know, because maybe they had a website, maybe they had marketing material, but they just certainly weren't getting the message across. So, um, Otto, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? What's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I really appreciate you bringing me on here, Daryl. And, and, um, you know, I, I love talking about this stuff. This is stuff that I just, um, uh, just absolutely love marketing. I love the psychology of it. I love the, the structure of it. Um, I know, you know, a heck of a lot about structure and you, I mean, you've, you've taken, uh, businesses that were about to go under and put in a few key systems and structures that then turn them into, you know, um, multi-million dollar companies and, and, you know, it's, it's that, that, uh, that love of this, of this, um, this work that we both have that enables us to, to perform at a high level. And, and, um, you know, I, you know, you, I know you've done some incredible things and just being here on your show, um, is truly an honor and thank you. Thank you, Otto. I value and appreciate you too. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.